It's six o'clock in London. It's 1 p.m. in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid Livestream, Series 18, Episode 4 in the aggregate. That's Episode 106, Start here and let's kick off with a bit of news from the home team exchange invest the force business newsletter which i publish we kicked off our 10th anniversary celebrations this week a decade of exchange invest which harks back to a time when gosh they were just planning to launch lme clear poland's kdpw and russia's nsd were planning much more fundamental csd cooperation plw pith was evident too as i noted in issue number one competition like opportunity remains everywhere in this space. How true that is to this day. Meanwhile, the London Stock Exchange Group, they have set up an MOU. They're going to be establishing a tech center of excellence in Hyderabad. That's, of course, the case where they are setting up a center of excellence in Hyderabad. They already have a center of excellence with 600 people in Bucharest. They're looking to add another thousand people in India. They've got countless people in Sri Lanka, although, of course, at the Millennium Plant, what we know is that parsimony has led to a huge exodus of people. And more significantly, ladies and gentlemen, only Exchange Invest brought to your attention this past month the fact that there is no longer a sales operation for the technology for exchanges, clearinghouses and CCPs and CSDs within the London Stock Exchange Group. Heaven knows what's going to be going on at the new Centre of Excellence. In Hong Kong Exchange, and indeed in Hong Kong per se, two great announcements this week. First of all, Hong Kong exchanges will soon produce rules to enable trading on typhoon days and ICE. Singapore can accept Hong Kong clearing members. That came in the same week, of course, May 15th. We had the great launch of, finally, Swap Connect is live all the way into mainland China. Watch that Remnimbi yield curve trading in Hong Kong in the near future. Very, very exciting times throughout Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, at the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they had a model, modest kerfuffle at their AGM. Support evaporated for executive compensation and shareholders nearly removed the chair of the compensation committee, Charles Carey, from the board. Charles Carey sweeping home, well, not really, actually, just about sweeping home. 156 million votes got him onto the board, but there were 130 million against his position. Pretty much a tight mandate of just 54%. And meanwhile, that vote on the individual compensation that was not carried, only 91.5 million votes for and nearly 193 million votes against. On the other hand, let's look at something positive this week. And actually, we had thought a long time ago, perhaps we could mark the 10th anniversary of Exchange Invest with a very positive, upbeat speech about the parish of exchanges. Well, actually, if you're going to watch one thing this week, ladies and gentlemen, other than, of course, IPO vid with the wonderful guest today, Jeff Carter... Go and check out on YouTube the Inspirational American University AU commencement address by Adina Friedman. AU, of course, is also the symbol for gold. And this is a speech that is pure gold, a fitting inspiration about life, markets and our many exciting prospects, all based around trust at the epicenter of financial markets. Good work and congratulations on the honorary degree, Dr. Friedman. Our guest today is Jeffrey Carter, our topic from the Merck Floor to Angel Funding. Jeff Carter knows his key strengths include being innovative, strategic, transparent and knowing how to get the edge. He took the ethic from the trading floor of my word is my bond and brought it into practice with early stage investing. Jeff is a partner at Early Stage VC West Loop Ventures an early stage VC fund that invests in B2B fintech companies and was the driving force behind HydeParkAngels.com, the most active angel network in the Midwest. Jeff was an independent trader at CME for over two decades. He was a member of the CME board of directors back when I first met him, actually. And he had an active role to play in the remaking of the member Mutual into a for-profit public company as an active member of the Strategic Planning Committee, and he chaired 
and co-chaired several committees during his time as a member of CME. Jeff, great to see you today. Where in the world are you talking to us from today? Las Vegas. Gosh, Las Vegas, Vegas. speculative hub. Not yeah. so much for risk transfer, but pure speculation. That is that is for sure. Um, I think the best statisticians in the world actually reside here in Las Vegas. I was watching a hockey game the other night. Uh, the Golden Knights, of course, are in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And and the over-under on goals uh, in the game was like six and a half. And there were six goals in the game with like five minutes to play. It was These guys are uncanny. Um, they should be trading. They should be writing algorithms maybe or something like that. It's weird that we've known each other. You said decades and so that just means we're old i think um you know uh it's weird i i got my cme um gratuity fund thing that my friend jimmy olaf used to run and it shows the merc members that had paid in that um had died and and, and i'm starting to know like more and more of them and that's kind of a, a melancholy thing to get in the mail <laughs> <laughs> You that know? is, yeah, that is rather melancholy as you go yeah. through those sorts of people passing away around you. Yes, it's yeah. it's uh, it's rather a shame to see, and uh, certainly amongst male mortality, it starts getting quite serious, it's which true. is which is really not really not entertaining at all. But anyway, I mean, talk to me. How did you get to work in the CME? What what drove you into finance? It's you know, I, I have a, a classic Chicago story um, of going down there. I used to tell Washington politicians that, um, that, that, that the exchanges in Chicago grow locals like farmers grow corn. Um, so, you know, uh, you knew somebody. And in my case, it was my high school football coach who had gone down there and done really well, who his brother had gone down there and done really well and really bunch of his brother's friends from Oak Park, Illinois, John Wilkin and Billy Higgins and Gary Zerfoss and Dean Rogers and you could, Michael Perry. You could just list scads of them from Oak Park that went down there. And so Orv um, brought me down when I had dropped out of the Air Force Academy. He says, don't go back to college, just come back here. And I looked at the floor and I thought, this is for me, but I got to get a degree. And um, I was literally in a bar in Chicago where one of my friends might have worked for some Italian people paying and collecting on Thursdays. And Orv walked in and he was a big football better. And he asked me what I was doing. And I told him and he said, I'll have you making a hundred grand a year in three months, quit your job. So I quit my job and I made 150 a week for three months as a runner. But, uh, and my <laughs> desk guy that ran the desk told me I'd never make it. And you know, the rest is history, but um, it was, you know, the most rewarding experience I ever had in my life. Uh, John Lothian, who, uh, you know, calls it, you know, 5,000 people that couldn't be employed by anybody. And that's probably <laughs> accurate. Um, it was hurting cats every day. Every day was a new day. Uh, but the people that I met uh, down there um, were incredible people, incredibly brainy people, uh, incredibly analytical people, along with people that shot from the hip. So, it, it was all comers, all kinds of people, and you had to survive in that environment. And it taught me a lot about myself and about survival. And it was able, you're able to translate that to real life if you're, if you can do it. It's so interesting. I mean, that's a great quote from John Logan, actually, because, yes, the floors had this amazing melange of people. I mean, I always talk about uh, Paul Gallico when he was a novelist, because when he was a famous novelist, he still used to go and report in Saturday night ball games for yeah. one of the New York papers, you know, and everybody was saying to him, why are you here? You're a novelist. You don't have to be here. And he would look around and literally with, you know, hot dog ketchup being smudged on him by people left, right and center. And he'd say, but all human life is here. And that's always the thing that I'm, I'm very keen to point out about markets. And certainly when you went to the Merck floor, all human life was there in it's every possible respect. Incredibly, it was an incredibly entrepreneurial place. Yep. Um, and so you talk about markets. I'll tell you two, two quick stories about markets. There was this guy named John Bailey who became a mentor of mine. He, his badge was JBS and he was in the Euro dollars and he was a huge trader. And um, John said, I, I want to retire. And everybody was like, well, 
what's going to happen? Who's going to make markets in these markets that he makes markets in and these double butterflies and all this exotic crap that he traded. And the day he left, there was somebody there to make markets. And so, you know, that's what people don't understand about markets. Holes get filled very quickly. Then I went to University of Chicago to get my MBA. And, the, you know, uh, the great thing about Chicago was it took all this stuff that I had learned on the floor and quantified it mathematically and proved what I knew in my gut. Um, and so I had a professor there who told me, you know, people don't think it's true, but the most innovative sector in the economy in the world is the financial sector. And it's because of markets. And um, they're just fascinating, fascinating things. Um, and, you know, I, I love free markets. I love educating people about free markets. And dangerously today, we have a lot of people that don't believe in free markets. And there's reasons for that, but um, they're wrong. And, you know, I can't be any more blunt than that. <laughs> well, it, it's it's so interesting. I mean, you, you can't be any more blunt about it, but it is true. I mean, it seems incredible to me that we have this internet and everybody who uses the internet every day, they use an exchange. They may not realize they use an exchange, right. but the backbone model of e-commerce is the exchange. Because exactly. when you use Uber, Amazon, eBay, whatever, Airbnb, it is all an exchange model. And this is the thing that always has like driven me mad. And, and I've probably said this many times this show because you, like me, have gone to a million startup conferences and we'll, we'll get there in a minute. But you always have that person who stands up and goes, you know, it's amazing. Airbnb, they don't own a single property. And Uber, they don't own a single car. And it's like, because it's an exchange. I mean, it's That's the right. most perfect means of allocating capital to work, to right. product, to demand that the world has ever seen. Right. And, and yet and yet we have all these people who go, well, markets don't work. And you go, uh, well, hold on a second. You, you got up this morning. You probably ordered via an app to get something delivered to you, which arrived at your door from Amazon. As you were picking that up, you probably collected an Uber, you or a scooter or whatever. And it's just so crazy. It's, it's infuriating, actually. Um, it is. It's infuriating. And, and, and when you get right down to it, and I think the, the other thing that's infuriating to me is, well, free markets don't work. They need to be regulated. And the funny thing is, if you read this, um, study, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it was an English economist that was shot down in World War II. And it's called The Economics of a POW Camp. And it talks about how a market economy came out of nothing in POW camps in Germany and flourished. And then when they regulated it, 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 it went away. Um, it was so big that somebody needed an accountant for their coffee stand because it was just so wild. Um, and you had people trading with ever, uh, other people and because they had free will basically um, inside this little microcosm of a POW camp um, and no regulation, they were able to have gains from trade. And humans are wired to do that. We've been wired to do that ever since, you know, God put us on this earth and, um, you can't go against human nature like that. I think the people that are anti-free market are going against human nature. The only way to put that sort of system in place is at the tip of a spear and, um, and put the people like you and me in gulags. So, uh, and it doesn't work still. So, um, but yeah. it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you're talking about that. I think the, the paper was by, was it R.A. or J.A. Radford? That's Somebody it. like that. Somebody That's like that. Radford was the economic organization of a prison camp. That's and right. it, and it's, it's very interesting. It was published in 1945, just That's after right. the war, one of the first economic papers. And yes, it's incredible to see how that goes on. It, it also reminds me of a great story about one of the leading bankers in China, who was sent for re-education and the Cultural Revolution. And they said, did you not find that horrendous? Because, I mean, literally this guy was still in sort of his suit that he had been working in the bank and they'd lifted him and he was in a rice paddy somewhere. And he said, well, even though it was communism, I knew that economically it wasn't going to happen. Because, and I love this statistic, in the Cultural Revolution, you still got paid whatever was your prevailing salary when you were being re-educated. 
<laughs> so this guy was on, okay, VP of the biggest bank in China was not VP of the biggest bank in the USA today, but it was, you know, he was standing there on 10 or 20 times as much money as the guy next to him, who was quite literally a hawker or, yeah. you know, a painter or something. And and he said, I'm just sitting around here and I'm thinking, well, you know, this, this whole thing's going to collapse in like two or three years because they're going to realize that actually they can't afford the cultural revolution. That's right. And I also, that was a great statistic, but this is a very interesting point about, about Radford. And I mean, it's interesting. Let me just go to the audience. Hi, audience. Uh, John T. Good evening, all. Good to be here. Delighted you could join us. We're here talking to Jeffrey Carter on the very exciting topic of going from the Merck floor to angel investing. Similarly, Matt Timms, it's lovely to have you with us today, Matt. Thank you very much. Good evening, Patrick and Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this evening, don't forget to send us a little bit of love. We would really appreciate that because love powers AI and AI powers us up the charts and therefore more people get to hear about markets and what the good they do for people, the more statistical love we get. So give us a little heart as you're going along. Thank you very much. And actually, we've got an interesting question from John T. Let's just jump into that. Do you think that the advances in technology have actually increased the greater innovation in financial markets compared to the past? Um, I think it's made it faster. I think what um, really drives innovation is competition. And so technology has made markets more competitive. The fact that there's more access to markets, you know, I mean, at the Merck, we kind of had a little club on the floor and we opened up access and now it's more competitive. Um, and that drives innovation. So I think it's really competition that drives innovation, not technology per se. Um, technology just makes it faster, enables it to scale faster, enables it to put, you know, tools in the hands of more users faster so that um, they can, you know, that, and that increases the level of competition, frankly, because, you know, if you think about arbitrage, um, it, hap it you can arbitrage a market for a while and then it goes away if it's a competitive market. Um, and then you have to figure out a better mousetrap. So uh, that would be my answer to, to John's question. Thank you very much, John T. Yeah, technology and enabler, it helps facilitate things, but ultimately it's human ingenuity that gets us going somewhere. And that probably would lead us to a chat GPT question very rapidly if we got there. But but tell me, so you went onto the floor. Talk to us about that. You've got 5,000 people, predominantly men, all around you. You're trading yeah. all sorts of things. How did you find the, the pit, the market for you, and how did you get underway trading? So... For me, I, you know, I came from a middle class family. My dad was a teacher. Um, I didn't, I knew or, but I didn't really know anybody. So I had a network around, um, which was great for me when you think about it, let's say 30 years later, when I had to network around the angel space, um, I had already done it. Um, it also afforded me the opportunity to meet a lot of people on the floor. When I ran for the board, people knew who I was. Cause I had networked around. Um, my first job was with a guy named Roger Carlson, who, you know, well, um, oh, yeah. Roger backed me. I was his fifth employee. I was a clerk. Um, I clerked for a guy named Dave Vecchioni. He and I are still friends today. Uh, Vec is a great guy. He's a great follow on Twitter. Um, and, um, and, and I loved working for Roger. He gave me the capital to trade and as a matter of fact, John Bailey, the guy that I mentioned previously, he said to me, he said, Jeff, he said, you're too good a trader to work for somebody else. You got to work for yourself. And I said, I don't know, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Roger, I talked to Roger about it. And Roger worked out a way for me to work for myself and leave him amicably. I, I love Roger for what he did for me. And, um, and, and always indebted to him. But Roger helped put me on a course where I could be successful. Um, one day, for instance, um, I was trading and I took a shot. I had a Fed time. I lost 25,000 bucks. And I went up and he was behind his desk, not trading at the time. And I said, hey, I got some bad news for you. And he said, he looked up from his desk, you know, and he looked at me and I said, you know, I, I just lost $25,000. And Roger said, oh, he said, keep trading. And, um, you know, didn't bat an eye. Um, so when I 
proceeded to lose $350,000 in one day because of the way Roger educated me. I could absorb the hit and I kept trading. Um, and, um, and I kept trading until I couldn't make money anymore. And the reason I couldn't make money on the floor uh, was the transfer to electronic trading. And I was one of the guys that was unable to really make the switch. Um, I had lost my edge. It's not like I was, um, you know, bagging orders or anything on the exchange, but I had a speed advantage that nobody else had. And once that speed advantage went away and the markets became thinner, you couldn't lean on orders or anything like that. I was a big spreader. Um, and then the spreading algorithm took away all the edge too. So um, it kind of put me out of business. So I had to figure out something else to do. So, yeah, I mean, that was a traumatic time. And and f fair power to the, the CME. Obviously, we were talking to Jimmy Olaf just a few yeah. weeks ago. That's a great show, actually, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't seen it, go, go watch it all about really one of the men who was absolutely pivotal in driving the CME into being a for-profit company it's, and driving it electronic. Uh, I, I would say I would echo that. I think uh, Jimmy is very understated in what he had to do. Um, I, I can still picture him in his office smoking cigarettes and seeing all the model football helmets behind his desk. <laughs> and we had lots of conversations and, and Jimmy, um, really, really, you know, Scott Gordon and he, but Jimmy drove the strategic planning committee. Yep. And um, Jimmy was the absolute right choice to do that, given, you know, what people don't understand is in member run exchanges is very political. Um, yep. If they think Democrats and Republicans in the United States fight, you should see people fight over pit space. Yep. Um, so Jimmy was on the broker side um who didn't want the change um he was part of that side and i was part of the other side um and we had a great relationship uh i mean and, and it was really jimmy that drove that relationship with me because um he knew that you know it was good it, there were things that were going to be adversarial yeah. Um, but Jimmy asked the right questions. He asked them in the right way. Um, and um, he he doesn't get enough credit for what he did to drive that train. That's and I'd say that to my grave. And and uh, I think other people would echo me in that, too. Yeah, I, I think I think that's been quite interesting. Actually, my my mailbox has been huge in recent weeks since we had Jim on the show, because everybody's been writing in to say thank goodness that somebody was giving Jimmy the accolades that that he deserves because he really yes. was a pivotal figure there were many people involved many people drove the mark forward but the things that he did were, were quite sensational and his speech to that uh, what was it the shareholders annual general the seat holders annual general meeting the members meeting which really explained and laid out how the mark simply was in danger of not surviving if it didn't embrace modernity for sure and we you know you could put it this way. Uh, we, we believe in free markets. There was a free market for seats on the floor. Um, I paid, um, what did I pay? 580000 for my seat in 1992. It went to $1.2 million uh, in valuation. Seat leases were seven, 8000 a month or whatever, and everybody was fat and happy. In 1998, that same seat went down to 280,000, yeah. uh, which was reflective of the future. So markets take everything that's known and price it into today's prices. Everybody thought we were going out of business. Um, and so, you know, if you bought one there, you had a great buy. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, we were going out of business for sure. Nobody thought we'd make it. Yep. Quite incredible, amazing times altogether when you when you look at that. So so the transition to electronic trading didn't work out so well for you, and no. that left you with you know. And I'm sorry, and it's it's ironic because therefore I feel like I failed as well because the one thing the Mark did under Jimmy's stewardship was to set up this digital 
uh, center. They had not only was it, a, was it an electronic learning center, they even had people like me come along and try to teach people how to go electronic trading, at least try to explain the differences to give people mm -hmm. some thought. And that was the only exchange that did it in the world. And it will and ever, it, forever to the credit of the Merck, not because it employed me as t some of the time, but just the fact that the Merck did that for its members. It was a great effort. I think we saw London go electronic and how yep. disruptive it was. And we were trying to ease the disruption and try to make it so members could survive in the new environment. Um, but the fact is a lot of us were used to the tactile human environment and didn't understand that you couldn't chase a market, didn't understand how stops worked in electronic market, just didn't under. And frankly, um, in, in the early days of those markets, the volatility at any, so if you think about it in terms of calculus, the volatility at any certain point in time in an electronic market is actually greater than in a human market. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's more variance from point to point. And I've seen actually a, I think a Northwestern professor or Stanford professor did a study on electronic trading and showed that the faster the market goes within milliseconds, there actually is more variance in price than there is in a slower market, which right. is kind of interesting. Um, and so I couldn't make it. And it was a very dark time for me. I've had, I mean, 15, 20 friends kill themselves um, because when the money dried up, things happened. Um, when the money dried up, people got divorced. When the money yes. dried up, they turned to alcohol, they turned to drugs, they turned to anything. Um, the interesting thing, I think, with a lot of people, um, and I'm not talking about the people that made it on the floor, the people that made the switch to electronic trading had either, they had something else going for them. Um, they had, you know, scads of capital, um, but they usually had either uh, an information edge or the ability to absorb volatility in a different way than you did on mm -hmm. the floor. Yeah. Um, the people that didn't make it went into professions. We were talking about this the other day with people that were self-directed and, um, you know, didn't have a lot of employers. So like you see a lot of guys from the floor that are in real estate or they yep. become franchisees or in insurance or they're doing wealth management or something like that where, you know, you still eat what you kill. Um, you're still sort of self-directed, um, but, you know, you're not, you're not working for the man. Um, yeah, yeah. You just and, a lot of people like that. And it always strikes me like real estate investment is, it's a bit like the difference. Real estate investment compared to the floor is a bit like the difference between athletics and Tai Chi. You know, real estate investment is kind of like the slow moving thing, but then it all suddenly happens. Whereas, yeah. whereas, and, and that's actually, I think that was the biggest difficulty for a lot of people was, I wouldn't say everybody had ADD that was on the floor, but they were used to everything happening, bang, 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 bang. And the idea that, you know, even the best property transaction takes days to close, if not weeks. And there's all sorts of issues. Uh, and I mean, people just go deranged. And then you have to sort of mess around in order to transform the value or whatever it's going to be. And that takes ages. And, and it is, it's a totally different Zen state, which you becomes very to, difficult. You have to take what you know um, and understand that at the end of the day, you're not going to know where you stand. Yeah. And, and you have to be a builder. So there were people on the floor like myself that were, you know, builders, um, we would have done extremely well in Silicon Valley had we know how to program, but we could have been great business development people too. Um, the one thing that um, I think traders have over virtually everybody, and I'm talking about back in the day, is just this insane competitive streak where they will get up earlier than you. They will work harder than you. They will do anything it takes to win. And um, you have to figure out a way to channel that energy and ethos into a different sort of occupation. Um, and it's tough because you don't get the immediate gratification that you got on the floor. Yeah. Um, or, you know, and so, you know, uh, you, you'll see it like, like on um, dopamine hits, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so people get addicted to dopamine on social media, same thing on the floor. Yes. Um, so, 
uh, you know, everybody was kind of like that, but, but, um, you know, some of us made it, some of us didn't, I didn't, uh, but I, I figured out a different way and it was a dark time. It took me from 09 to 2016 to really see the light of day. And, um, mm -hmm. in, in all that time though, from 07 to 16, I was making angel investments. And then we raised a very small fund in 2016, which now, has sunsetted. Uh, the fund is closed to new investments, but it's doing quite well. Um, and ironically, my partner was a computerized trader that had never, ever seen the floor that had worked for get-go. So um, it was a melding of worlds. We don't talk about trading, but uh, okay. Tom, so, I'm on so, so what, got, what got you? No, so it's interesting though. I mean, I'm fascinated. What what caused you, I mean, what, what was the catalyst that you saw this opportunity in the startup angel investing field? Well, um, there were a number of things that happened. Number one, when you were on a trading floor, um, because there was a concentration of money there, there was always some deal flow happening. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember my buddy invested in this train that was going to go around the world and do this bicentennial thing. I mean, it was a loser. Somebody invested in oil wells. Everything was always a loser. It wasn't good deal flow. It was deal flow. Um, and so you had a risk appetite as an investor. The other thing about trading is if you're a good trader, um, you looked at the market, you looked at the macro market, you looked at the charts, you looked at all this, and then you had to make a gut decision, right? And then you had to put your money out there. And if you made money, you made money. If you didn't, you had to figure out how to get out. Um, and... Um, and get out in the best possible way with angel investing of course it's roach motel because there's no liquidity if you really do want to get out yeah. um, and um then you 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 had risk analysis and trading like how much capital am i going to commit to this trade well same with angel investing how what's my check size what should it be how much risk should i take uh oh they're doing another round of fundraising should i press my winner should i put money in or is my money better allocated somewhere else? So you have all these similar sorts of decisions. Um, the other thing that um, was fortunate in my life was uh, my last two years of school, I went to the University of Illinois where they invented the internet. And mm -hmm. I lived with a bunch of engineers. Well, those guys knew a bunch of people that were inventing the internet at the time. It was 1984. That's how old I am. But, you know, the first internet browser was um, made there, Mark Andreessen. Um, mm -hmm. Yelp, Netscape, um, you know, all these companies came out of U of I and it was like, man, if I could have invested in those, I might make a little bit of money. Right. Um, but the last thing that was fortunate, just very lucky in my life was I went to high school with uh, two of the people that helped to start up into it in California. And I heard these stories about, you know, how, you know, they'd done really well. Well, you know, I was friends with them and you check it out and here they were and, and you hear their story about how they started into it. And now it's a big public company. And yeah, they did really well, but they worked really hard and they took a lot of risk. And um, and so I had all that and I'm like, boy, I'd really like to do that. Um, the problem was in Chicago, there wasn't really an efficient way to do that. So my choice was started in Chicago or moved to the Valley and try to join the herd. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, traders don't like to join the herd. We can always do it better. Um, and, you know, we want to try to run our own show. So, and, and frankly, uh, as we looked at it, I thought Chicago had a lot of potential. It was a magnet for every big 10 university. Um, you had a big population there. You had a lot of talent inside the city. Um, you had, um, also, University of Chicago there, you had the Polsky Center, which was one of the best um, um, sort of college accelerators for startup companies around with a track record to prove it. And so there were, there were a lot of things there um, that could do it. Jack Sander um, invested in this one thing, I remember, and he was making a lot of money until it went broke. Uh, in the high level. But, you know, I mean... So you had a, a confluence of things. And we, uh, my classmates at Chicago Booth, uh, Michelle Verma and Ryan Humphreys and a couple other people got together and we said, we can do this. 
but they couldn't do it in Chicago because they didn't have the connections. I had the connections. And um, so we partnered with the University of Chicago to give us some credibility. And what, we introduced ourselves. And what was really funny at that meeting is I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, somebody asked me the questions, what are you guys going to invest in? And I said, we're going to invest in what makes Chicago great. Chicago's really good at certain things better than other places. And they said, are you going to invest in like hardware and high tech? And I said, why would we do that? We, you could just get on a plane or a train or drive out to Silicon Valley and get money for that. You don't need to do that. We are going to invest in, you know, fintech. We're going to invest in medical. We're going to invest in consumer products. Things that made that city great, where there was mm -hmm. a lot of DNA, people understood it. You had ready customers and you had people that under, you could get employees too. Um, and so uh, we did that. And um, I'd say by any measure, uh, Hyde Park Angels is wildly successful. It started in April of 07. Um, uh, I built it with, uh, you know, help from a lot of people to what, what it was. And, you know, it transferred uh, ownership and, and they're still around. Um, our first investment out of the box happened to be a card shuffler. Um, and it seems like a really stupid thing, but it returned 19 and a half X. Um, you know, uh, Simple Mills, uh, one of the leading um, consumer products brands in the sort of non-GMO, uh, you know, gluten-free space came out of there. Um, lots of companies have gotten funding that couldn't. And so uh, we, I think, you know, cockily or without a lot of humility, I, I would say Hyde Park Angels kicked off the seed stage investing boom in Chicago without us. Uh, it doesn't probably happen in the way that it did. Um, and it's uh, created a lot of attractive companies to work for there. Um, I, I thought I really was comfortable doing angel investing. Um, I really like it. You have to like it. Um, you, you, you have to uh, there's there's a part of it where, you know, uh, in trading, you have all kinds of control until you make the trade. Once you once you make the trade, you have zero control over what's going to happen. And angel investing is like that, too. So you meet two guys in a garage or two females in a garage, whatever. Uh, you can do all the diligence you want. But um, at a certain point, you got to write the check and turn over control to them. And even as a board member on a, a small startup you don't have voting control. You don't have control. So you can input, you can suggest, you can cajole, but um, they're going to do what they're going to do. And uh, so sometimes things go wrong. Best example I can give um, of how it all sort of works on a successful uh, way is, you know, I used to scour um, different accelerators for companies. So there's gazillions of cell accelerators all over the world. Um, and I found this one company in a Techstars uh, insurance accelerator in North Carolina that I kind of liked when I read their description. Got on a phone call with them, talked to them, really liked them, flew down there, um, met them in person, met other companies. Uh, it turns out I was right. I wasn't interested in any of the other companies, but I really did like them. Told them so. Um, they came up to Chicago. Uh, I took them to their first baseball game ever. It turns out both these guys were from China. Um, and I said, you know, just as a side question, uh, why the hell did you go to the University of North Carolina? Most people from China go to schools that are west of the Mississippi. And they go, we love NBA basketball. And there's a lot of NBA basketball guys here. So <laughs> that was the reason they chose North Carolina. And, and so... Um, my partner really liked him. We had a 50 50 arrangement where if one of us didn't like the company, uh, we could push what we called the big red button and not invest. And uh, so we decided to invest. We led the deal. We invested, um, I think, 700,000 in their seed round. And um, another VC firm out of California who was absolutely great to work with um, invested. Um, they launched and COVID hit right. and COVID put them out of business. Um, I talked to them and I said, how's it going? And they said, we've lost our entire top line revenue because of COVID. 
Um, they were doing insurance for Uber drivers and, and they were doing some other stuff in, in that space, income insurance and things like that. And, um, and so I said, look at, um, I, and this is where, this is where, uh, as a cool headed trader, um, you have to reach into when the market goes against you or whatever, when all hell's breaking loose, you stay calm. Um, there's times to lose it and there's times not to. Um, and I think great investors are good psychologists. And so uh, that carries in the stock market and the futures market. It also carries in angel investing. And so, you know, I had a guy here who had lost his entire business. He was afraid of failure and he didn't know what to do. And I said, look, it, we invested in you as a person. We think you're great um, and you are going to figure this out. Uh, how much money you got in the bank? He told me knew the runway we knew the burn rate had that figured out okay we're, we we know our time when we got to figure this out i think we could do easily another investment in a convertible debt note at this price um which will carry you more and i'm sure the other investors be in too because this is this covid thing is stupid and it's a rare occurrence and you came out of the blue and we'll figure it out so sure enough um he figured out a business he raised another round of venture capital from um first round ventures. And um, he raised another round with Lightspeed. They're going gangbusters. Um, the company's growing. Uh, I don't know how many employees they have now. I'm not on their board, but I still talk to them and they're doing really well. Uh, and so that's an example of things that could happen. Um, and it can be really lucrative if you invest right. Um, it can be painfully uh, debilitating when you invest wrong. So right. you have the scars to go the other way too. And I can tell stories about that. But, well, uh, it, it's one of the things I was thinking about, about startup investing and angel investing is that in some ways it would be so much nicer if your losing trades went bust quickly because you'd have much less pain. But it seems to me so many of them take such a long period of time. They they quite often die slower than the average opera singer in, in a 19th century French so, opera. So there's zombies like that. But mm -hmm. um, what I found is your, your bad investments will die within two years. Right. Um, your good investments take five to 15 to pay off. Right. Um, so then, you know, you go to, let's say you're going to raise a fund and you've been angel investing for three years and somebody says, what's your track record look like? And you're like, well, I've got these guys that look really good, but they haven't exited. And I've got, you know, th these three over here and they died. And the guy's like, wait, you, I don't think you can do this. You know, <laughs> I mean, I had a, I had a company where I was the absolute first check in. They were going like gangbuster crazy. They signed a term sheet with a big, big venture outlet at a valuation that I thought was absolutely insane. I think it was almost a billion dollars. I was in it like four or five million or something. Right. And I'm in my head counting my money, talking to the guy. And I'm like, hey, can anybody want to buy some stock here? You know, because <laughs> I'll sell. And because um, I knew the valuation was way ahead of itself. Well, turned out the stock market tank. And these guys pulled out and then the company wound up going bankrupt. So right. that's what happens with, you know, some of your winners is until they actually exit and you ring the cash register, you can't count them. And the stock market definitely affects what's going on in the underlying the private markets. Mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. saw that last year. So uh, when the NASDAQ fell out of bed and the stock market fell out of bed, um, it may not have because these things only price every so often, like real estate. Yep. Uh, it didn't show in your portfolio, but if you weren't intuitively marking down things, you weren't doing a good job for your LPs. And so, so, um, you know, my, our portfolio for sure took a hit, but I think our fund is probably up seven and a half X or something like that. We made eight investments and, you know, nobody's gone out of business yet. We've had some exits, We've got a couple of companies that are just absolutely crushing it. And mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way it goes, right? It's the power law of venture for returns. So fascinating. Um, and so tell me, I mean, when you were in angel investing, I imagine there wasn't one single playbook, but you've mentioned the idea of doing like convertible debt notes and so on. 
I mean, when people come along to do sort of seed rounds and stuff like that, that you were active in, what was there a particular kind of valuation metric or there particular valuations around to this day? Or did you choose to buy equity or, or do something that was a little bit funkier? Yeah. So I've done all, I've done everything. I've done priced rounds, common stock, preferred stock, convertible debt note, safes. Um, what I would say is um, investing in, so ca capital finance and startups is no different than operation strategy or marketing strategy. It is, you want to build a vertical line up and to the right. It's momentum that builds on itself. And so um, when you come out, um, the valuation of a company is a dark science, right? It's out of Harry Potter. We divine it, boom. Um, there are no numbers in the world that can support, uh, let's say an $8 million valuation for two guys in a garage doing something with $10,000 a month in revenue, right? Um, and uh, the simple fact of the matter is you got to come up with a number. Now, that aside, numbers are numbers and there's demo, demonstrably um, factual numbers that you can look at. So if I invest in a startup of over an $8 million pre-money valuation, my expected IRR is about 20%. If I'm under 8 million, my expected IRR is, you know, 40% or something like that. Um, in the startup space, it's going to take a certain number of rounds to get to exit. So you have to have a conversation with the entrepreneur about what type of startup they want to build. Do you want to build a startup that sells for $50 million? Do you want to build one that sells for a billion dollars? Because there are two very different companies. There's very, very different financing schemes, very different ways about going about it um, and very different expectations. And so you got to have those conversations with entrepreneurs at the very beginning to set expectations and then you follow through. And so um, what we in our, in, in angel investing is different than fund investing in the fund model we would have very hard conversations with entrepreneurs about stuff. And then we would tell them, look, we need to have this sort of ownership percentage at seed because we're a small fund. We're not going to be able to invest past series A and we expect it to have this many rounds. We're going to get diluted 60 to 70%. And right. every check we write as a fund into any company, we expect to return the entire fund. Right. So this is how that math works. Um, and we would show them the math and you can't quibble with it because it's math. Right. And right. so um, really all we're talking about is valuation and the future of the company. And that's, you know, if we were perfect at predicting that, you know, macroeconomists would, you know, uh, be like the most prized specimen in the world. They're always wrong. Right. You're always wrong. Yep. But um, you got to start somewhere. So that's a we. That's the way I looked at it. And then. Um, once I made, once I wrote the check, I would do everything in my power to support the company. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's an exchange you should actually take, take a look at. Um, and your, your, your viewers, because they're in finance might like this. It's called bitnomial.com. They're based out of Chicago. Uh, Luke Horston started it. He was at Alston trading and it's the only DCM in the entire world that can deliver physical crypto. They trade futures on crypto, options on crypto, and they they can th their contracts are set up for delivery. So there's a first notice day, and you actually get this much Bitcoin in your account. Mm -hmm. uh, you hold it to expiration. It's not cash settled, um, unlike the CME futures. And so it's very different. And you know, I've helped him find employees. Um, he, you know. He's doing things that nobody else is doing. He's a really cool company. Um, and so that's what you have to do as an investor. Once you get in, you have no control. So you have to be um, like Gilligan, your support person. You're not the main event. You're, you're not the main guy. You got to put your ego aside. And all you do is kind of help them problem solve. And you ask good questions. Um, 
I think um, as I've done this longer, I, I ask better questions. I understand it better. You get better as you, you go along. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that my MBA did do for me was it gave me the confidence and chops at least to analyze a business mm -hmm. um, where before I had it, you know, a little bit, but this really sharpened my skill. Um, and then as an investor, you have to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Um, and be honest about that. Um, you can't be a jack of all trades. You can't do this. You can't do that. And there's certain things I am really not good at. And so when somebody asks you for help with, you know, can you help with like for me, operations, can you help with operations? I'm like, forget it. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. your guy. I'll try. I can know people that are good at it, but I'm not that guy. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to be really humble about that. And, um, and those are the best investors, I think, um, are truly humble. Um, and um, I think, you know, politically, I don't agree with Fred Wilson probably at all, but I think he's one of the greatest investors out there and he brings that ethos to it. Um, and when you look at his track record, he's pretty goddamn successful. So um, he's got, he's, he's not all hat, no cattle. He's all hat with a lot of cattle. You know? <laughs> so tell me, I mean, what, one interesting thing, you mentioned Bitnomial there, and that, that's a very interesting business. Yeah. Um, you obviously, you know, you were at the Chicago Mark when, good grief, I think when you joined the board, am I right in thinking the valuation of the whole company was like a billion dollars or less or something less, like that? 100, and, and 100, less. 100 to 150 million. Right. And, and it had basically nothing in the bank. I mean, 5 million or something in the bank. 25,000. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's incredible incredible to think think that that was a gift of a, and it's now worth a mere 70 something billion or something well we were a non-profit right yeah yeah i mean just so like price. you know you'd get to october if you hit your number it's like okay commissions are free the rest of the year yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and everything's fun i know it's it's quite incredible to think about but but you saw the power of the exchange model explode with the for-profit exchange business and so on did that give you any impetus towards investing in exchanges or did you just simply not see the opportunity? No, I, 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 I've looked at lots of different exchanges. Um, the only one I've done, I've done a couple. Um, but what's interesting about the exchange space, um, especially with the rise of crypto and Frankly, um, you know, I didn't see, let's say, FTX or I didn't see Binance or I didn't see a lot of the, mm -hmm. those exchanges. But the ones that I did see, I always my first question out of the box um, was, what are you going to do about clearing? And if they looked at me blankly, I knew I wasn't going to make the investment <laughs> because that's the most important thing. Right. Yeah. And, um when you match trades, you can download anything from the internet that'll match trades for you. So your trade engine, everybody wanted to show me this fancy trade engine. I'm like, I don't even care about that. That's easy. Um, you know, what's hard is clearing and settlement and pays and collects and how are you going to yep. do this? And, you know, what are your rules? What are the rules of the road and all this stuff? And uh, the very first meeting with Luke, he had answers to that question and good answers. Um, and the guy's a great, you know, he's, a, he's just a really good entrepreneur. Um, we invested in open finance and, uh, it didn't start out as open finance. It started out in the real estate space. Um, and they became still to this day, I believe the only exchange to get through the sec thicket and become approved to trade security tokens. Mm -hmm. Um, we, got through that, tried to list security tokens, found out that the Ethereum gas was, cost of gas was screwy for us. And then the SEC kind of put the kibosh on doing it. So we didn't have a business, but we still sold that business um, and didn't lose any money on it. Mm -hmm. So that's how valuable that license was. So, I mean, um, I think you can invest in exchanges and then people will show you something this is an exchange model. Is it really an exchange model or not? Um, how do you create liquidity? Well, you know, I, I always say you have to have natural buyers and natural sellers. When you think about corn, 
right? There's natural yep. buyers and natural sellers. And then you got to get speculators in there and blah, 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 blah. But I understand market structure probably better than 99% of the people mm -hmm. uh, out there investing in exchanges. And I think um, I know how to ask the right questions. So I thought when FTX exploded um, and then I heard the podcast with my friend Terry Duffy and he said, how are you going to clear? It's exactly the question I would ask yeah. FTX. And he kind of gave some bullshit answer. And Terry looked at him and said, you're a fraud, <laughs> which is perfect. Uh, it's so Terry, uh, you know, uh, and it was exactly the right thing to say. Well, I, I don't think that a lot of the VCs that are out there right now are asking those kinds of questions because they don't have the experience in, like I do in the exchange world to ask them. Yeah. And so uh, when you don't know what you don't know, you can't ask the question, you know. Yeah. You I, 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 I feel the same way. I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity out there for building new exchanges and new exchange investment. But what I see all the time is a total misunderstanding of what are the things that actually drive oh. the success or failure of exchanges, sure. which, which is a fundamental problem. Right. So, Jeff, I mean, I'm mindful of the time. We've been gliding through this hour so beautifully in, in every sort of way. And uh, let me just say, oh, thank you, Ian Miller. Hi, both of you. Good to hear your IPOs, Patrick. Thank you. Interesting times in exchanges and cryptos coming up, one thinks. Yep, certainly going to be interesting times, I think, without any doubt there, Ian. Thank you so much for your comment. Jeff, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask you the question we ask everybody at this stage. Where do you think the capital market revolution goes next? That's a great question. Um, I think in the near term, the bigger players get bigger. Um, so everybody hates the big banks. I think they get bigger, especially if you look at the collapse of um, Silicon Valley and stuff and the resulting knee-jerk reaction from government. Um, it's just paved the way for them to, to get bigger. Uh, I think there's so much fear of failure and fear of risk-taking in sort of the regulation side of the market that they don't want it to grow and, and happen. And that's going to make the power players already more powerful. At the same time, when you have big, huge verticals like that, there are uh, entrepreneurs that will attack them. And so they'll find ways to attack them. So, um, you know, I think crypto is going to have a lot to say with it. I don't think anybody's built anything of note yet that's really great. Um, I don't know where it's going to come from. I think what people have done that I've seen is they've taken analog processes that work in the existing industry and crypt, put them into crypto and have crypto around them. But they haven't thought out of the box about what it really means to have a decentralized network. So um, when you think about, let's say, centralized clearing, um, people really hate the Merck because they're able to charge for data. They've got centralized clearinghouse. Clearinghouse, though, really is a crypto type thing. It's just centralized in one place. If you think about the B share, the B share is like a token, right? Um, and uh, so they could tokenize their B shares and, you know, become a decentralized exchange, right? Um, if they wanted to. Um, it obviously doesn't behoove them to do that right now. Um, I think you're going to see, because of technology and cryptocurrency and things like that, you're going to see markets become way more efficient, uh, especially in supply chains. I think there's markets out there that right now function, let's say, in barter or they're very inefficient that are going to be made much more efficient, which is going to promote more gains from trade, raise standards of living, Um Things that are highly regulated today, like water, like electricity, um, when they transition to a free market system, will become more abundant and more efficient. Uh, I live in Nevada. Everybody's worried about water. Uh, if it was in a free market system rather than a highly regulated system, we would have gushers of water here, believe it or not, in the middle of a desert. Uh, it goes back to the Milton Friedman thing. Um, if the government was in charge of this hair desert in five years, they'd be out of sand. And I think that's true. 
Um, so um, I think the hurdle free markets have is the fact that they're, they appear rigged. There's so much crony capitalism out there and there's things built into the market system through regulation or other factors that cause them to look rigged or in fact, they are rigged. Um, I, I, I mean, the LME and the nickel market is a perfect example, right? Um, and so I think in the short term, I think we're not going to see a lot of startups come on the scene and blow it up, let's say the existing verticals, but in the long term, we will. Uh, the real innovation right now and has been forever is in the payment space. And that's because it's relatively unregulated and there's a lot you can do around it. So, I mean, even we have a company out of Ireland called Pippet Global, um, which is facilitating payments between immigrants and um, in London. So it's a very fascinating company. Um, and Ollie's been a great entrepreneur, good Irishman. But, um, um, you know, that's that's what I see. I, I, and I think eventually, I think India wins over China. I think centralized governments fall. Um, and uh, I think the next century is going to be the North American century because um, supply chains are too risky now. And you're going to start to see stuff consolidate given the right tax policy in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's so many resources here, um, natural and otherwise, human capital too, um, that uh, give it a big leg up over the rest of the world. And on that note, good grief, there's a lot to digest there. Who would have thought that we would have started talking about the CME Mark floor today, ladies and gentlemen, gone through the economics of prisoner of war camps in World <laughs> War II and reached a stage where we're discussing the macro geopolitics of the world, all framed against the capital market revolution, having enjoyed a tidy conversation about the whole art of angel investing on the way through. Jeffrey Carter, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you today. I hope you enjoy a beautiful rest of the day in Vegas next week. A AFM, the Association of Futures Markets, they're going to be celebrating their 25th anniversary during the course of this year. It's coming up their 25th anniversary conference in a few weeks' time. We've got their chairman and president, Pat Kenny, the chairman, Paul Constantino, the president, coming up next week. That's going to be our show, which we're looking forward to, which will actually be on the 23rd of May, not the 3rd of May, as it seems to suggest. And I just want to say thank you very much, Matt Timms, John T, Ian Miller, for your comments and questions. And in response to your final remark of the evening, John, uh, Ian Miller, I think PLY should just build an exchange. That would be the best idea. Send me checks. I've got some great <laughs> ideas for you that can come together and make magnificent exchanges, Ian, without any difficulty whatsoever. Thank you very much once again to our guest, Jeff Carter, to our production team today, Natalie, Fernando, and Richelin. My name is Patrick L. Young. I wish you all a great week in blockchain life and markets. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for watching IPO Vid.